the first thing I want to talk about tonight is, is where the Non-Human Rights Project currently is and where, where we have been over the last year, year, year and a quarter. And then I want to go back and talk about why we came to the place we, we are now. And then I'll, I'll go to uh, where we might be going. So we'll start, I'll start with the present, move to the past, and then go in, into the future. The real problem that the Non-Human Rights Project has been trying to overcome is the legal thinghood of all non-human animals. So today, as every day has been, there is a dividing line. And on, on one side of that, or, the, or a wall, I, I, I view it as a great wall, and on one side of that wall are all the non-human animals, and they are on the thing side of the wall. On the other side of that wall, the person side of the wall, are human beings. There aren't any non-human animals there. Now, it's very important to understand what the difference is between a thing and a person, because the difference is fundamental. It's fundamental. So, when you are on this side of the wall, and you're a legal thing, and all non-human animals are, but you also have, have to know, and I think it was alluded to tonight, you know that there have been, throughout history, many humans on this side of the wall. Slaves, women, children, and indeed, much of the civil rights movement over the last centuries has been to kind of bang a hole through that wall and feed these human groups over to the other side of the wall and then kind of plaster it over and now you have it all set up again with all the humans being on this side and all the non-humans are now on that side. And to be a legal thing means to be invisible to judges. It means to have no intrinsic value. Your value is instrumental to legal persons, which are now human beings. You don't, have the, you don't have any rights at all. You don't even have the capacity for any rights at all. You are a slave to the persons. To be a person is to kind of be the golden child of the law. Uh, you are highly visible to judges. You count in law. You have numerous rights, perhaps an infinite number of rights. You certainly have the capacity for an infinite number of rights. So for now a century or more, uh, that wall is there to keep the humans separate from the non-humans. Now, you also have to understand that while there were humans on this side of the wall, on the thing side of the wall, and they were kind of fed over into the person side of the wall, there have been many, and there are many, entities who aren't humans who are also persons. Uh, one of the first things that the Non-Human Rights Project tries to do when we go in front of a court and also through our briefs, uh, and if you go onto our website, you will, you will see that when we start making the argument, the first thing we say is that person and human are not synonymous. Because if you speak to a person in the street, a human person in the street, then frequently they will intuitively think that person and human being are synonymous. And to the extent that judges think that, we're not going to get anywhere in the courts. So we have to be able to immediately try to disabuse judges of the idea that personhood and human being are, are the same thing. We agree there's an overlap, but they aren't the same thing. And we, we begin by showing them that there have been many humans who have been things, and then they became persons. And there have been many other entities who are and have been and are today persons. We talk about in the United States, I'm sure it's true in Australia, there are corporations, you know, ships, uh, states, partnerships, but there are other, other um, common law countries, Eng English-speaking countries, uh, have other sorts of examples. Uh, we cite in our, in our briefs to the court, uh, there's a pre-independence Indian court in which it was held that a Hindu idol was a person. Another held that a mosque was a person. In 2000, the Indian Supreme Court uh, held that the holy books of the Sikh religion was a person. And then I know many of you know that in New Zealand in 2012, there was a treaty between the 
indigenous peoples and, and, and the crown, in which a river was said to be a person that owned its own, its own bed. So personhood is really a, it's a policy issue, it's a principle issue, it's, it's not a biological issue. So we are trying, the Non-Human Rights Project is trying then to, to break through that wall because we think the wall is not in the right place. I'm not sure where the right place is, and we don't ever argue to a court was it what is a necessary condition to break through that wall, but we do begin to argue what is a sufficient condition. And the way we came up with that was, and I'll, I'll speak more about it when I talk about the past, but we argue out of what we think are the values, the set of values and principles that common law judges, the common law judicial system holds, that judges have believed they learned it at their, they drank it with their mother's milk when they were in law school, when they were lawyers, when they were judges. They intuitively believe in certain kinds of values and principles. And we appeal to those values and principles. And the ones that we do most are the ideas of liberty and equality. So we really don't have to spend a whole lot of time persuading judges that liberty is important and equality is important. Now we just have to try to show how the application of those means that that wall is not in the right place. And there are some non-human animals who also ought to be legal persons be using, in, in invoking these fundamental values of liberty and equality. So the way we do that is we try to explain to the judges, and oftentimes they, they're ahead of us, they already know. Liberty is a non-comparative right. So one has a liberty right, not because one is comparing oneself to someone else, but because of who you are, how you're put together. It's, you're, you're not comparing yourself to anyone. You're entitled to it because of who you are. And, he, and a, an equality right is, is a kind of a comparative right. So you're entitled to an equality right because you are like someone else who has that right in a relevant way. And of course, there's the rub. You know, everyone and everything is, a, is infinitely similar and infinitely different to everything else. And that's where we get into the arguments as to what, what is relevant. Of course, our opponents will always say, as a matter of equality, the one fundamentally relevant thing is that someone is human. And that's the only thing that counts. And then we begin to get into the arguments as to why that's not the only thing that counts. In fact, it may not be relevant whatsoever. A, one of the liberty rights that we focus on, and by the way, again, we're not trying to create new law. Um, perhaps you might have been able to tell by my gray hair, I've been practicing animal law, yeah, maybe almost 40 years. I don't know where it went, uh, but it's, uh, when I look in the mirror, I realize it did. Uh, so we look at what judges and legislatures and international treaties, we look at what they say. We try to make the judges do what they say they believe they ought to do, which is why we appeal to these values and principles that they say that they hold dear. So those may not be the same from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So I will tell you a little later how it happened, but it, we be, the Non-Human Rights Project decided to file suit the first suits in the state of New York. And when we filed suit in the state of New York, we then, we then that was really the uh, culmination of looking at 70 or so jurisdictions, English-speaking common law jurisdictions throughout the world, all 50 states, DC, Puerto Rico, uh, looking at the law of each of these states. It required us looking at about 60 different issues for 70 jurisdictions. So, that's more than 4,000 issues. So we, we didn't have a handful of us. We had dozens of lawyers and law students uh, taking over seven years to go through these jurisdictions, try to understand uh, how they all shook out 
in all of these dozens of issues. And then once we're able to line them up, then we try to put them in a hierarchy to see where might be the jurisdictions that at least on paper might appear to be the most attractive or, or the least unattractive. So we chose uh, in, on Easter Sunday of 2013, a group of us who had been meeting in a hotel every four or five months in Manhattan, three or four of us who had been going through these dozens or hundreds of memoranda a year after year trying to understand uh, what these hierarchies, you know, how we could set up a hierarchy. For example, we we're interested in habeas corpus. How did these jurisdictions deal with habeas corpus? Uh, was it a con did they see it as a common law issue? Was there a habeas corpus statute? Was the statute supplemental to, to the common law? Was it, did it supplant the common law? Did it, did it procedurally regulate the common law? Did that state have a, did its constitution have a suspension clause so that you, if you tried to abrogate the common law, it would be unconstitutional? So that, were you allowed to appeal if you lost a writ of habeas corpus? If the judge refused to issue one at the trial level, could you appeal? If you made a procedural mistake or if you lost the case, could you then file it again and again? New York seemed to be a place where we might be able to do those, those kinds of things. It had a very broad writ of habeas corpus. It had two centuries of judges telling us how wonderful the great writ was, how powerful it was, how fundamental it was. We say, fine, we believe you. They, taught, they, they allowed us to, to uh, file it again and again, the, the idea of res judicata or, or um, uh, claim preclusion, issue preclusion, did not apply to a writ of habeas corpus. In theory, we can file it an infinite number of times. If we lose, then we try again. Not only that, we might try again in, a different, in, in front of a different judge, and that judge will not be bound by what the other judges said. Although the statutes do say, well, you know, eventually you don't have to look at it as closely as you might have had to look at it the first time, but still they have to at least hear us out to some degree. Uh, can we appeal it? We could appeal it. Is there a suspension clause? There's a very powerful suspension clause in the New York Constitution. And so that and dozens of other things, it, it, it has a history of, of a flexible way of viewing the common law. And there were dozens of other reasons why we finally chose the state of New York. And it wasn't an easy choice because there's a good six or seven states, some American states, that are very close to the state of New York. But we decided for various reasons uh, that we wanted to do the state of New York. So we also, we, not only do we have a legal working group, but we had a science working group. So once we chose the state of New York, then we said, would you please, to our science group, identify all of the great apes, all of the elephants, and all of, all of the cetaceans who were in the state of New York, because uh, that, was going to, they, that was the pool of candidate species we wanted to look at. And the reason we wanted to do that was because, and especially for, for uh, animals like chimpanzees, for example, they have been studied intensively, both in the wild and in captivity, for over 50 years. Jane Goodall's on my board of directors. Maybe that did something. Uh, what, what they've learned is that they, they are extraordinarily cognitively complex beings, extraordinarily. And that was important to us because they were also extraordinarily complex, not in, in a sp specific way. It's not just that they're smart. We're not looking for animals who are smart, intelligent. We're looking for animals, non-human animals, who are autonomous, that we can argue that they're autonomous. And why do we care that they're autonomous? Well, we don't care that they're autonomous. Judges care whether entities are autonomous, and because they care, we care. If judges cared about something else, then we'd start caring about that. But it's, it's clear in the state of New York and, and other places that autonomy is a supreme common law value. One thing that one that's one of the things that really attracted us also to the state of New York. There were cases coming from the 1980s where, where the Court of Appeals, which is the high court, for some reason in 
New York State, the Supreme Court is the lowest court. So, but to so the high court, the Court of Appeals had had a series of rulings in which they had emphasized the importance of autonomy. They, for example, will allow someone who is in a hospital to refuse life-saving medication or surgery. And the court will say, we value your autonomy. We will enforce your autonomous de decision. It's more important than the state's interest in your life. If you want to be to autonomously and you have the ability to be that way, you want to die, then we're going to let you die. And so that was very important to us. So here you had a court that enunciated very clearly either a supreme or nearly a supreme common law value, autonomy and self-determination. We said, fine, we're going to look for animals who are autonomous and have self-determination. Bingo, chimpanzees. And so we then, as you might know, um, if you're litigating a case, you have the law and you have the facts. So I'll go back and begin to explain the 30-some years it took us to figure out how we wanted to deal with the law. And then once we're able to make the argument that autonomy is a sufficient condition for legal personhood, then we have to be able to prove that they are indeed autonomous beings. So we scoured the earth and we found nine extraordinarily well-respected chimpanzee cognition researchers who are presently at work. We found them in Japan, in Germany, in Sweden, in England, in Scotland, in the United States. And we asked for help. And we said, we need to have you draft affidavits for us that, that we can put in front of a, of a judge pursuant to New York's habeas corpus statute, which doesn't regulate the substance of habeas corpus, but it regulates the procedure. And it, allow, it allows us to put various kinds of, of affidavits into evidence because habeas corpus is generally worldwide, or at least those countries who have it, a summary procedure. It's not going to be a complex trial. And oftentimes, it even is a battle of affidavits. So we wanted you to put in the studies, Talk about your work and the, other, and, and, and the work of others. Some of the, of, of the experts had been working with chimpanzees for more than, almost more than 40 years. They, they really knew what they were talking about. And we ended up with more than 100 pages of affidavits that set out, I think, 42 different cognitive abilities of chimpanzees that separately, certainly together, we thought made it clear that chimpanzees were autonomous beings. Not, not only were they, were they autonomous beings, uh, were they also, as, as I, I guess as part of it, it, it was clear uh, that, they, that they understand that they're individuals, that they exist through time, that they, that they were alive and understand there was a yesterday, that there's going to be a tomorrow. In fact, we argue that the very fact that they can think that way causes them to be injured in the exact way that a, that a habeas corpus is meant to prevent. Because a writ of habeas corpus is meant to prevent autonomous, self-determining beings from being imprisoned in a way that destroys their autonomy, their self-determination. And so we argued to the courts that a chimpanzee, in, because she is autonomous and can self-determine, when you put her into a cage, she suffers the way that we would. When you put them in a cage, we treat them the way we, we treat our worst human criminals. And we do it to punish them. And chimpanzees are punished in the exact same way, except they didn't do anything and they don't know why they're there. But they do know that they're there and they're lonely and they're miserable and they suffer and they die. And so we showed that through, we are showing that through affidavits to the, to the courts. We show uh, that they have language, or if I want to stay out of the language wars, what is language? Don't anyone ask me what is language afterwards. I'll just tell you right now. I don't know. But so I say they have language-like capabilities the way I have language-like capabilities. <laughs> and they can engage uh, in in a communicate, they can communicate and they can change the what they're, how they're communicating with the way that the entity with whom they're communicating are communicating back. 
And that's it. I'm, d I'm done with language. Okay. So they, ha they can engage in simple mathematics. You know, they, they, can, they can count. They, they can understand you know, how to add, how to subtract. Uh, you know, they're not geniuses in math, but you know, I have a lot of my law students who don't do a whole lot better than that. <laughs> uh, they, have, they have culture. We showed that they have material culture. They have a social culture. They have a symbolic culture. And I explained that there's even a discipline called chimpanzee archaeology that began in 2007 in the Thai forest in the Ivory, Co Ivory Coast. Um, there is a, there, there are chimpanzees there who have these special kind of rocks they use and, they, and they, tr they open up these incredibly hard shells of nuts that they eat from. And if you and I were put there and that was our only food source, they would then come collect our bodies you know, the, next, the next month because it's not easy to learn how to do that. It takes chimpanzees several years to learn how to, how to do that. And they, they excavated around there and they found evidence that in that area, chimpanzees, that kind of, of a material culture, had been passed down for at least 4,500 years through 225 generations of chimpanzees. So they have culture, and they have lots of other things. Together, we argue, they are autonomous and self-determining beings. So we show, we show the, the affidavits to the court as, as an aside, we weren't expecting, one thing we didn't look at was how hard it is to get the affidavit of someone who doesn't live in the United States in evidence in a New York court. Uh, it, was some, it really surprised us, uh, and uh, uh, it was so complex that we uh, finally invoked an international treaty on, on doing that, and even then we had to get law firms from other countries, and we, and, uh, we had to get everything stamped and ribbons hanging down. It was, you know, it's not something that we look, usually see in the United States, and it was very interesting when we finally filed it in, in, in the clerk's office how they were trying to figure out how they can like stamp through all the ribbons, uh, but, uh, but indeed they, they were able to do that. Uh, so that's our liberty argument. Autonomy is, a, is, a, is, is sufficient. It's a sufficient for personhood, at least personhood for the purpose of a common law writ of habeas corpus. Now, personhood can, is a very protean thing. So just because you're a person for one purpose does not necessarily mean you're a person for other purposes or every purpose. And our argument is laser-like. Our argument to the court is that we are arguing that chimpanzees are persons solely for the purpose of a, of, of a common law writ of habeas corpus. That's our first argument. Now, we also argue that as a matter of equality, chimpanzees ought to be persons. Equality at its minimum requires that when someone, a court, a legislature, makes a distinction, draws a line, that, that it, be, it, it, it involve a, a rational relationship to a legitimate goal. That's like bare minimum equality law. At least it is in the United States, and I suspect it is other places as well. And we don't argue the rational relationship. If you're gonna say uh, humans have, all humans have rights, chimpanzees don't have rights. We say that that, is an, that, is, that that line violates common law equality, and the reason it does that is because enslaving an autonomous being is not, an illeg is not a legitimate end. That to draw a line between chimpanzee, all chimpanzees, all human beings, is drawing the line for the sole purpose of enslaving chimpanzees. It's not a legitimate end. So, it, and I, 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 uh, you can take my word for it that our argument is a little bit more complex than this, but it kind of boils down to that. So, we in March of, on, after Easter Sunday of 2013, we then understood what our legal arguments were, where were we gonna make them? We're gonna make them in the state of New York, and then we brought our, the head of our science working group up on Skype and said, tell us where the great apes 
the cetaceans and the elephants were. And we spent hours going through them all, looking them up online, and we chose two chimpanzees as our first plaintiffs for a common law writ of habeas corpus. And they were named Reba and Merlin, and they lived in a roadside zoo in a little town called Catskill, New York. We got them online. We could see them online. Now, about three weeks later, I got in a plane. I flew and then drove to Catskill, New York, paid my $14, I think, and went into this awful little roadside zoo and looked for Merlin and Reba, and I only found one chimpanzee. And I said, where's the other chimpanzee? And it turned out that, that Reba had died three weeks before. So I actually went to Merlin and said, we're coming back for you. We were not, that was not to be. In September, I sent my executive director back to that roadside zoo, and she then learned that Merlin had died the night before. So this was now the end of September 2013. We were determined to file our lawsuits the first week of December 2013. We were also appalled by the fact that these two chimpanzees had both died within six months of each other. And so we decided that we, we had a, kind of a superseding or an additional moral obligation to, to locate every chimpanzee in the state of New York and file simultaneously, file simultaneous or seek simultaneous writs of habeas corpus on behalf of, of them all. So we, by using our computer research skills and, and everything else that we could think of, we located five of them, or I'm sorry, six of them. We believe that there were six chimpanzees in the state of New York. So off we went. I also want to tell you that um, uh, there was a person who was writing a very long article for the Sunday New York Times Magazine. He came with me, so every time I talked to someone, there was a guy standing beside me writing in a pad. No one ever asked who he was. Um, and if you want, you'd read it, if you want to learn about what we do, April 27, 2014, Sunday, New York Times Magazine. It has an, a very interesting cover. It's a spectacular, startling cover. It's of a chimpanzee in the witness stand wearing a suit being direct examined. And, and inside, they tell the story of the non-human rights project. But there was also someone else, um, D.A. Pennybaker and his wife, Chris Hedges, who are probably two of the you know, most well-known documentary filmmakers in the world, uh, and uh, Pennybaker, known as Penny. Uh, Penny won, was the only documentary filmmaker to win a, an Oscar for his for lifetime achievement. He won that in 2012. So for some reason, thank goodness, four years ago, they, I was able to persuade them that what we were doing was important enough for them to take four years out of their life and follow us around and document it. And so uh, that, I'm pleased to say, they've done. They've sold the film to HBO, to the BBC, to French television. Uh, I don't know, find out if they sold to Australia television not, and other places, and it's coming out within the next six months. So they were, Chris Hedges was there on, to my right with a camera. No one ever asked what she was doing either. So we then were, went to a place called Gloversville, New York, where we thought where there were two chimpanzees there, based on what we knew online. We first went to see the chimpanzee who we thought was, was Tommy. And we knew that Tommy was, was living somewhere on a used trailer lot in Gloversville. And I didn't quite know how I was going to see him. Uh, and I think I'm on camera actually frantically calling my executive director saying, OK, we need to talk about it. How am I going to get on this? And, here, and how am I going to see him? And she said, well, you know, they also have reindeer on, on, on the property. And they take the reindeer down to Florida every Christmas. And they do whatever you do when you take reindeer to Florida. So, uh, but they'd been on the Today Show, which is a big morning show in the United States. So, I just went up, there was a young, there was a man who was fixing a tractor. I thought he was the owner. So I said, uh, do you have any, I hear that you have reindeer that you take on the Today Show. He said, yes. I said, can we see him? He said, yes. So the three of us went on, the writer, me, and the photographer, and, and the, the documentary filmmaker, we went on, and we had a half an hour reindeer conversation <laughs> with him, um, which I frankly learned a lot. And then, and then we said, 
any other animals? Do you have any other animals show us? And he said, well, there's a chimpanzee over there. And we said, really, can we see him? And so we went into a large warehouse-like structure. And then in, it was kind of dark in there. And I thought there looked like some kind of little jungle gym. And then, and then there was a, a dark window that you could peer through. And behind that was Tommy. And Tommy was in, and is today as I'm speaking, was in a, ca a cage. With, there was a bank of cages, maybe nine more. And, and he's the only one. And there was a little portable television set that outside of his cage that he was watching, or at least it was, it was on. So eventually, we asked if we could go in. We took a photograph of Tommy, which is actually becoming an iconic photograph. And, and we just asked questions about it. And so then we headed out. OK, so we, now we knew Tommy was there. We then went to our second chimpanzee, which was supposed to be a mile down the road, another roadside zoo. It was closed. We went on there looking around for chimpanzee. And we found someone and said, do you have any chimpanzees here? And, uh, and they said, no, they had monkeys. And, we, and then we really believed them. And we realized that whoever does the, the, the uh, media for the zoo doesn't know the difference between a monkey and a chimpanzee, because they had a picture of a chimpanzee on there. Then we drove to Niagara Falls, which is where we thought Kiko and Charlie were. And we went to a cement storefront. It was a beautiful day. I yelled, anybody in here? A guy comes out holding a spider monkey, which he gives to me to hold. And I have someone taking notes and someone you know, shooting what's going on. And, um, and though I didn't, never saw them, I, after speaking to him for half an hour, it was clear that there were two chimpanzees back there, Kiko and Charlie. So we knew they were there, but we couldn't see them through the darkness. So we knew that that, that was three of them. Charlie. Charlie was also to die before we were able to get the, uh, the, the, the suits in court. So by the time we filed suit, three of the seven chimpanzees who'd been alive in March of 2013 were dead by, 2000, by, by December of 2013. Then we got into an airplane, flew the, all the way over the, to Long Island, and tried to find Hercules and Leo, which we, which we believed were, were there. We, we, we really thought that they were there. Um, we were completely stonewalled there. No one, the president's office, the media office, the scientists, nobody would ever say anything about Hercules and Leo. You know, Hercules, Leo, Hercules, Leo, what are you talking about? And so we then had to use other ways, kind of deep, deep underground ways. Are there chimpanzees in this university or not? And when we filed the suits, we were 95% certain that, that they were there. When we filed the suits, it was confirmed that they were there, and we knew for the first time that they were certainly there. So we prepared our suits to be filed the first week of December 2013. And then we began with Tommy. We you go onto our, our website. Everything that we do, is, is, is we're completely transparent. Whether we win, whether we lose, whether the, ju the judges say we're nuts, whether they say we're, we're, we're not nuts, whatever, everything's up there and that, that, that's involved in, 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 in the suit, you can see. The transcript, the interesting transcripts of the colloquies between me and the judges. And so, so we went and we said, we want to file this secret writ of habeas corpus on behalf of this chimpanzee, on behalf of the chimpanzee. And so we ended up getting assigned to a judge down the road in another county, literally, in the middle of the woods. And, uh, and we went in there and the judge, you know, we handed our stuff in and we sat in the law library, like pacing back and forth. And, the, and someone says, the judge wants to see you. We go into this very large courthouse. It seats more than this auditorium does. And all of a sudden, after arguing, after, after being what I say, an animal slave lawyer, arguing animal slave law for, you know, for more than 30 years, I was arguing in front of a judge that a non-human animal was a legal person who ought to have a right. It was the first time in my life that I'd ever acted as an animal rights lawyer. And, uh, you know, and I understood that I mean, for me, it was a momentous occasion. The judge was extraordinarily friendly to us. And with great regret, he re refused to issue the writ of habeas corpus, which we expected. In fact, we didn't expect a hearing. We expected to put the papers in and get them out saying, we're not issuing writs of habeas corpus on behalf of chimpanzees. And we had a colloquy. You can see it. You can, you can look at the transcript and see what it was. And we, we wanted to know, what's on the judges' minds? What do they, why don't they like our arguments? We, never, we knew they weren't going to like our arguments, but we didn't know why they weren't going to like our arguments, because we believe they're powerful. 
but we, that doesn't mean they're going to win. But we know that, the, that they're powerful, so we want to know why. So here we got our first taste of why we were going, why we were going to lose. He basically said, or actually more than basically, he said, a chimpanzee is not a person, so I'm not going to issue the writ of habeas corpus. We said, fine. And then we drove out to Niagara Falls, and we did the same thing again. We went in front of the judge and said, we, and, and said, we want Kiko, you know, we want to issue a writ of habeas corpus to free Kiko. Uh, we didn't do it right that moment. The judge said he actually wanted to read the stuff. He said he set up a telephone conference call for us, and then we argued and argued. And you can see the transcript. The, the judge finally says, and I quote, I'm not going to be the first to make this leap of faith, unquote. We said, we understand, we understand, and so uh, we're going to appeal you too. So, and that's one of the reasons we picked the state of New York, so we can appeal. And then we went all the way over to Long Island, and that's where all of our fears materialized. The judge refused to issue the writ of habeas corpus and never even wanted to see us. The papers did go in, the papers did come out. We're not, we're not doing this, and it's because he's not a person. And we, if he ran me down on a bicycle, I would not know what he looked like. Uh, I just had, we, we, we never saw him. So we decided to, to appeal that one too. So then, all of a sudden, we have three cases going up. Now, New York has four intermediate appellate courts. The first, second, and third, and fourth departments. Absolutely coincidentally, all our three lawsuits were in three different departments, the second, third, and the fourth. So they're going up to three intermediate appellate courts at the, at the same time. We wondered whether we wanted to do that. Should we have consolidated them? I mean, every little thing we like argue about incessantly. Um, uh, but no, we, it's the most remarkably egoless, egoless set of lawyers I've ever seen. Uh, you know, people argue and then they back off, and we basically have operated by consensus for eight years. And so, we first, the first case to get any get any traction at all was Hercules and Leo's case. So what happened was that, since I'm not a member of the New York Bar. And in, in the United States, you have to, every single state, you have to be a member of that bar. I'm a member of the Massachusetts bar. And so I can't practice in the state of New York unless the courts allow me to do it pro hoc vice. So at every level, we have a New York lawyer who, who's a member of, our, of the Non-Human Rights Project asked the court if they would be so kind as to let me argue. And so far, they, they always have. So she then asked the Intermediate Appellate Court, the second department, and Tommy, in, in Hercules and Leo's case, will they let me argue? And the Attorney General of New York is the one who's defending them because it's a state university. And we get the first thing we hear from a New York Appellate Court, we get a piece of paper back saying, the petitioner having requested attorney wise to, uh, to be admitted pro hoc vice, the Attorney General N having, n having not objected, we hereby dismiss your case and deny the motion because there's no more case. So we said, oh, wow, uh, did we make a mistake in going to the state of New York? Because we, this is not how we imagined that it might be. We did not really think that that was going to happen. Because one of the reasons that we chose the state of New York was we could appeal. And they said the reason we could not appeal was they said you are not allowed to appeal the denial of an ex parte request for an order to show cause, which is part of the habeas corpus statute. So they just threw our case out without even hearing, uh, without even having a hearing or allowing us to object or anything. We knew that that was wrong because you just look at the statute, you know you can appeal. And we thought, should we appeal to the Court of Appeals? We thought, no, it's going to take time and money. We said, you know what we're going to do? Another reason we, we chose the state of New York, you can just keep filing it. We're going to file it, and we're not going to file it in this jurisdiction. We're going to refile it somewhere else. So while that was happening, then the next court that came up was Tommy's case. So Tommy is in the third appellate department. We then go to the other, go to the, the man who's holding Tommy and say, if you will send Tommy to an appropriate sanctuary, we will drop the suit. And he told us to go take a hike. No, he wasn't interested in doing that, which is another thing. In a writ of habeas corpus, and, and when, when you, if you win, what's going to be the remedy? 
Well, the, the traditional remedy is that if someone's being held against his or her will, is you, you, you just open the gates and you know, have a good life. You're free to do whatever you want, you autonomous, self-determining being you. You just go right out there. So we don't, we don't want our chimpanzees to go out into the street. They'll last 10 minutes. And so it's a little twist that the judges, that we, we have to make sure that the, that the judges, judges understand. So we had, we had researched this to a fairly well. We on this so-called kind of a lateral transfer, and, and we had seen that for 200 years of New York law, there had been all kinds of entities who had used a writ of habeas corpus to move from one set of containment to another containment. So we got an organization called the uh, North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance, and specifically we're interested in a place called Save the Chimps in Fort Pierce, Florida, about 100 miles north of where I live in South Florida. You know, if I'm a chimpanzee, that's where I want to go. It's a huge artificial lake, and on it are 13 one to two acre islands on which live about 25 chimpanzees in, in sunny Florida. And it's as close to a place where chimpanzees can live like they would in Africa, as is to be found in North America. So we also were ready to point out to the courts that there were cases that went back to the time when the United States had slavery, and when the North began to be abolitionist and the South was not. There were numerous cases in which a slave a child, a slave child, six years old, three years old, eight years old, had been brought by her master, his, ma his master, from a southern state where he was a slave into New York City or Boston, and where an abolitionist society had swooped down with, with a common law writ of habeas corpus and freed them. And we tell the judge, do you think they ordered that three-year-old, six-year-old, eight-year-old kid onto the street? No, they moved him from the custody of his master to someone else's custody. So we had all kinds of cases like that. We were ready to go. So we go into the third department, and it is like it, there's, it, it's a me, there's a media storm going on there. I actually walked into the courtroom, and I sat there, and it sounded like it was hailing outside because there was a bank of photographers there just taking so many pictures that it was like, it was like hailing around us. There was an intense amount of interest. And so the... the Third department there, which was Tommy's case, listened to us, and then they ruled against us. And they did not rule against us on the grounds that the second department had with respect to Hercules and Leo, which was you can't appeal. They clearly felt you could appeal, which is we thought they were right. But what they said was, sure, Tommy may be, may be autonomous, and he may be able to have rights, but in order to be a person, you have always have to, you have to be able to bear duties and responsibilities as well as be able to have rights. And then, but of course, we know that children, you know, the insane, I mean, the, the uh, you know, people with, with Alzheimer's, people in comas, lots and lot, millions and millions of humans in every country are not able to bear duties and responsibilities, yet we do not eat them, we do not use them for biomedical research. They have rights without responsibilities. So the court was thinking about that. They put a little footnote saying, this doesn't apply to humans. <laughs> we, uh, they get, they're the judges, they can do what they want, but we can ask to appeal. So we have, we, under New York procedure, we ask to appeal. We have to get three of the five judges who ruled against us to say, uh, yeah, I think we might be wrong. We're going to let you appeal. So that didn't happen. Uh, so then you can go to the appeals court, the Court of Appeals of New York, and see if you can persuade two of those seven judges to take your case. So we've done that. We have no idea whether they're going to take our case. We're waiting. Meanwhile, we go off to Kiko's. It was Kiko and Charlie, but Charlie's dead. We, 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 we go to Kiko's court, and an interesting thing happens there. In New York, you have to do what's called settling the record in order to appeal. The trial judge has to agree that the record that you're sending up to the appellate court is the right record. Well, the, our case was over, you know, like in 72 hours. Not many, you know, we had filed our things. There wasn't another side. It was an ex parte hearing. 
there wasn't much going on. So we filed a motion saying a motion to please settle the record so we can get our appeal moving. Weeks and weeks went by, and it, it, it wasn't ruled on. So we called up the, uh, the court, and the uh, judges, I'm not sure his clerk or his lawyer, uh, answered, and we said, uh, when's he going to uh, rule on the motion? And we were told, he's not. And we said, you mean he's going to deny it? And they said, no, he's just never going to rule on it. We said, yeah, we don't think you can do that. Uh, so we sued the judge in the appellate court to make him rule on our motion. And that happened, and the appellate court instantly, they, they set a hearing up on our, on, on our case, and it happened to be the, the week before we were the front page of the Sunday New York Times magazine cover story. And the, three days later, he rules on it, and he settles the record for us, and, and up we go to Tommy's court. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Kiko's court. Now, they also, we have a fascinating oral argument, and one of the things that they're interested in is what I just talked about. How, how can the writ of habeas corpus allow a chimpanzee to just go to a sanctuary rather than, isn't a habeas corpus used to give, to just send someone out on the street? You know, you're free. And I said, the slave cases, the you know, insane people, prisoners had used it, apprentices. I just, until if you look at the transcript, one of the judges, the woman on my left, said, okay, we get it. Okay. So of course, that's the reason we lost. They didn't, they, I don't know what they meant when they got it. It wasn't what I thought. Uh, <laughs> so they said they get it, and we lose on the grounds that a writ of habeas corpus is not an appropriate remedy if it doesn't involve an absolute release. So we respectfully disagreed. Uh, we got, again, no votes on those, from those five judges to go up to the Court of Appeals. And now we, we're up and we're, we've asked the Court of Appeals then to give, if we can get two judges to bring that up. Because not only the irony in, the irony in this, we believe, is rich. You know, that court, Kiko's court, twice said, we will assume without deciding that Kiko is a person, which said, we said, wow, okay, we're getting somewhere. You know, they, they have agreed somewhere in their souls that Kiko might be a person. Because I know if I had said, I'm filing a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of my washing machine, that they would not have said, we're going to assume without deciding your washing machine is a person. I just know that. So they somehow believe that, that maybe Kiko could be a person. So, so, but they said, you lose because you're not seeking an absolute discharge in, into freedom. And we thought, oh my, not only have they narrowed the writ of habeas corpus for chimpanzees, but they've narrowed it for all 20 million people who live in New York. <laughs> Which, and the irony was, is we chose the state of New York because of its expansive writ of habeas corpus, hoping that they would then apply that to chimpanzees, and instead they narrowed it for humans. <laughs> so that, we think, is also, you know, it, it's not stable. It's not stable. So we don't know if they've realized that, though we asked for a rehearing, and they, and, and they said, no, you lose. We, we, we affirm our, our decision. So now that's up to the New York Court of Appeals, and we're waiting to hear what they have to say. Now we decide that we're going to file suit again on behalf of Hercules and Leo. So we then, in March, refile our lawsuit in Manhattan. They're the first department. We, we've already been at the second, third, and fourth departments. We haven't been to the first department, so we want to go there. So what, what happens then, what is it, a week ago last Monday, is all of a sudden we hear that the judge has issued what we, what we had asked for. We asked for something that was unusual. We asked for an, the judge to issue an order to show cause and a writ of habeas corpus. Now, we didn't want a writ of habeas corpus. We wanted an order to show cause. Under New York law, and under law everywhere really, a writ of habeas corpus means, you know, it's, it doesn't mean you're free. The writ of habeas corpus is issued to someone to say, we think that you are legally detaining some, th this petitioner, and you have to bring the body in and give a legally sufficient reason for doing it. 
But the New York statute also allows you to, to issue what's called an order to show cause, which is you have to give, come in and give a legally sufficient reason for what you're doing, but you don't have to bring the body in. We had no intention of requiring them to bring in the chimpanzees into court. So we did not want a writ of habeas corpus because that's what we wanted an order to show cause. But the last time we filed a writ of uh, order to show cause, the, the uh, appellate court had thrown us out on the grounds you couldn't appeal from the ex parte denial of an order of a notice to, of an order to show cause. So we also threw in a writ of habeas corpus. We want an order to show cause and a writ of habeas corpus. So the judge issued an order to show cause and a writ of habeas corpus. And so we issued a press release saying, Hey, the judge, the judge seems to have at least implicitly agreed that they're persons, the re because only persons can have either an order to show cause or a writ of habeas corpus under the statute. It says it's only limited to persons. That's why we're having the fight. That, that, that is the fight. So the judge apparently was reading our press releases. Uh, in fact, we know the judge was reading our press release because we heard a communication from the court that our press release was wrong. So we issued another press release, which we thought maybe, and we said uh, it's not necessarily, the judge did not necessarily mean that. What the judge could have meant, and which is what she could have meant, we could have meant, we don't know, is that, she, is that just like in Kiko's accord, that a chimpanzee, Hercules and Leo, might possibly be persons. So she's going to issue the order to show cause, and she's going to require this, the, the Stony Brook folks to come in and say why they are imprisoning Hercules and Leo, which is perfectly fine with us. That's what we would have done. We would have, what we're asking for was that in the first place. But we've been burned the last time we sued on, on their behalf by getting our case thrown out. So we were trying, like good lawyers, to cover all of our bases even though we asked the judge to do two contradictory things, order them in with the chimpanzees and order them in without the chimpanzees. <laughs> so she then issues an amended order in which she strikes out an order and, and the words and habeas corpus. She just issues the order to show cause, which is just fine with us. But that is an extraordinary event for us because this, it's the first time that we're aware in which anyone in the universe has ever had to to come into court and defend their imprisonment of a non-human animal. We were, we were and are thrilled. Uh, this is, we, we all know, we're in, in for a long struggle. And we're going to win some, we're going to lose more. And we did not know when we, were, when we were even going to reach this level. We had the first hint when we lost Kiko's case where the court twice said, we assume without deciding Kiko's a person. We said, whoa, are we, are we getting somewhere? Is this a minor victory or are we just imagining it? And then the next time we file suit, the judge actually issues the order to show cause and orders them into court on May 6th. And I said, uh, Manny and Brian will be very upset, Your Honor, if I had come into court on May 6th because I have a long-standing engagement to be in Australia at that time. Uh, so uh, the judge moved it to May 27th. Take it up with Manny and Brian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we are getting ready for what we've been, what we've been getting ready for for years, now we're getting ready even more. And if, by the way, if the judge, if, if the Court of Appeals of New York does not allow us to appeal to them, we are talking about actually refiling both Tommy's and Kiko's case. And in Tommy's case, we're, we've already begun speaking to our experts, we're gonna file, we would file possibly additional affidavits pointing out that chimpanzees can bear duties and responsibilities too. We just didn't talk about that because we didn't think anyone cared. And that with respect to Tommy, we're, with respect to Kiko, we're beginning to talk about whether we can, in good faith, allege that we're gonna get Kiko and we're gonna put her right back in the wild. She's gonna be absolutely free. Now, now is he, are they persons or are they not persons? That's still kind of in the thinking stage, we have to see. That may happen, it may not happen. The Court of Appeals may take our case. Uh, 
And, you know, and, and that could be a double-edged sword, too. The Court of Appeals may take our case and say, now that we have your case, they're not persons, and they never will be persons. They could say that, but we, we'd want to know why, and I'm assuming they're going to, going to tell us. Uh, so it's all, you know, there are many, many pieces that are moving at, at the same time. Meanwhile, we're well into preparing for our next lawsuit, which is not in New York, on behalf of habeas corpus, on behalf of elephants. And we are doing the same thing that we, that we um, I've gone into the future without going to the past. Uh, we're, we're doing the same thing there that we were doing with uh, chimpanzees. We've contacted the best elephant cognition experts in the world. We have asked them to, to uh, uh, file affidavits for us. We're working with them as soon as we get the affidavits in. And as soon as I learn all the law of another state, like I've had to learn all the law of New York, then, which we're hoping is going to be in the fall, then we're gonna seek a writ of habeas corpus in that second state um, as well. And then the more the, w donations are finally starting to come in. We were an all voluntary organization from uh, 2006 <coughs> until 2011 when I hired an executive director. I got enough money to do that. Then I hired a part-time lawyer. And finally, after 28 years, I paid myself something last year. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so, the more money we get in, then the more staff attorneys that we're going to have and the more litigation that we're going to bring because, and we, we, have, we have many other causes of action that are beyond habeas corpus as well. And one of the other things we're doing is that we're, we're writing a series of law review articles because no one's ever written about so many issues that we're interested in. And we've just, we've just uh, published the second one and we're trying, we're in the middle of writing five more and at various stages. And the second one, was an article on the use of the equally ancient common law writ of the hominé replegiando on behalf of chimpanzees. I'm sure, I don't, I'm sure you guys know what the hominé replegiando is, so I won't go into it. <laughs> uh, but it, it's, it's really just like a writ of habeas corpus. They, they kind of came alive in the 14th century, and, and, they, and then for various procedural reasons, they stopped using the writ of the hominé replegiando, and it hasn't been used in the United States since about 1860. But we believe, very strong, and, we, and we show why, that it's still something we can use. And the reason we might want to use it is that unlike a writ of habeas corpus, which gives you a summary trial in front of a judge, a writ of dehomine replegiando gives you a jury trial. So we, we're trying to think, do we, want, do we want a jury trial? Do we not want a jury trial? I know every time in my life when I've lost a case in front of a judge, I'm saying, I'm going to go to a jury. And then when I lose in front of the jury, I'm going back to the judge. So, so I have, you know, we're not exactly sure whether we want to go in front of a jury or whether we don't want to go in front of a jury, but, uh, but we want to be able to do that. And one of the things that we really liked is that the law review who, print, who pub is publishing it is the George Mason Civil Rights Law Journal. And that's, we, that's what we call ourselves. We say, we are not and animal welfare, we're not even animal rights group, we are a civil rights group. Mm. And in fact, and, and we talk about, we coming from a different place. Of all the places in the world, Foreign Affairs magazine asked me to write an article last week, and I did, it came out yesterday, in which I try to show that animal protection, animal welfare comes from a different, has a different historical, different historical genesis than does and does animal rights or civil rights. And they are different sorts of things. And we were pleased as punch that they asked us to do it. And today I saw that Pravda had written, uh, had published an article about us. And so, and here I am in Australia. So, mm -hmm. we, you know, we see that, 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 that the work we're doing is, is beginning to, you know, kind of filter out into the world. And we're also working with lawyers in, in England, in Switzerland, in Spain, in Argentina, and one of the reasons I'm here is to meet up with lawyers and say, we want to work with you so that to lend you whatever expertise we're able to lend you. We're not gonna tell you how to do anything in Australia. We don't know anything about Australian law, but we do know something about personhood, and we wanna help you. And then that's why when we were, we were all ready to go, people called me from Auckland and said, would you come over and give a talk there? And apparently now I'm not getting any sleep. So yes, I said, I'll fly over to Auckland and, uh, and we're going to, going to do that. Now I'm gonna go backwards just a little bit. Um, so, so I went now, I'm going to the future. Now I just wanna tell you why we're doing what we're doing. 
So I began doing this in 1980. I had a wonderful, luxurious mane of brown hair. You should see my photographs. Uh, and, and also, when I, when I turned sideways, you couldn't see me. And it was just a whole different sort of thing. So I, I read Peter Singer's book. And that, that stopped me on a dime. And to the absolute astonishment of my law partner, I, decided, I said, I'm taking non-human animal cases from now on. And so I, you know, within a month, I had just changed. I, I, the reason, I see, I was a child of the Vietnam War. And I had learned about justice and law and politics through my anti-war movement work. And I read Peter Singer's book, and I thought, there is nobody, that's it. There, have you been holding the signs up? And I just, see, I told you, we needed a, something bigger. Okay, okay, you'll never know what the past was. So, um, and it was the, really the best part. So, alas, I do have to stop. Um, but the reason I want to, I'm going to stop, yes, I'm, I must, but I want to have questions. I want to, so I want to have a dialogue and questions so that we, we, we can talk about it. Anybody who agrees with me, just raise your hand and let's talk about this. 